Thank you, Chairman Goh. Thank you, Betty, for inviting me. I'm, I'm not, as the paper said, from India, actually. I'm uh, married to a Filipina, and I, I do other businesses here in the Philippines as well. Um, David Lobo sends his apologies. He cannot make it to this trip. So as the representative of DTA, uh, I'll be going through the, the presentation here today. I don't think we need to talk too much about India. We've seen the numbers already. Uh, India, as you can see, uh, I think the one interesting number to take away from uh, the, the previous presentation is probably the productivity per hectare. And I think part of the secret of this productivity per hectare you'll see in the next couple of slides. It is that DTA has been doing this for 30 years uh, and has planted more than 3 million trees, which, which you know, I, I've certainly gone and seen a lot of them. I've gone and spoken to the farmers, got testimonials. Uh, it's the real deal. Let's look at some of the numbers. Uh, let's look at the technology first, actually. Now, making hybrids. Um, I think we're all familiar with hybrids, clearly, in uh, corn, in rice, in wheat, in some of the more uh, short uh, short cycle crops, right? Now, the genetic technology of making hybrids is, is fairly complex. You've got to find a parent, uh, a father and a mother that are genetically different, but still uh, in, in the right, uh, what should we call it, the right genotype, the right uh, positions on the gene, so they complement each other. And when they complement each other well, and you've chosen the two parents carefully, you will get hybrid vigor. And hybrid vigor means that the F1, the offspring of this cross, is far more vigorous than the average of the two parents. That is the value of hybrids. Without hybrids in, uh, let's say, corn or wheat, we simply couldn't feed 9 billion people. It couldn't happen. So hybrid is a blessing. It's a miracle, and it's extremely important in our food security globally right now. now why haven't everybody planted hybrid coconuts? For two reasons, really. The hybridization is an experiment. So Ramon has done this for many years. It's not easy to find the right parent uh, on one side and the right parent on the other and match them up. If you don't get the experiment right the first time, you've lost seven years of your life. Now, not many people are willing to sacrifice their career on a chance that you get this hybridization right. So therefore, there hasn't been as much work done in coconut hybridization as there has been in the more traditional short-term crops. So what we have analyzed and what we've experienced is that there are pockets of excellence in hybridization. And I would say that no more than five or six individual research stations have, have cracked this. In what I've seen, uh, I have found that DJ is the most successful. And that's a function of a couple of things. Let's have a look at, at how it's done first. So there are currently five active breeding gardens, but DJ is expanding. So here's, uh, here's Madurai. Um, in South India. So what you have here is a, I think it's 23,000 Malaysian yellow dwarfs, that's the mother uh, in the breeding uh, arrangement here. So 23,000 uh, females and I think about 1,600 males. That's all the pollen you need to cross with the uh, females. Now, very important, this breeding garden is set in an area with no other coconut. That's fairly obvious if you think about it, because the whole point of this breeding is to take the pollen from the male tree and pollinate the female tree. So you can't have accidental pollination. That would ruin your business. So all these breeding gardens are set in areas where there's no other coconuts in, in uh, several hundred yards from the area. So that's important. There you go. So like I said, I think about 20, 23,000 MYDs.
Here's an interesting little tip for, for you prospective breeders that want to make a breeding garden. What, what DJ has done, which is rather clever, in some cases, of course, you do get accidental cross-pollination. So you may have some pollination, uh, which may be, as you probably know, the, the dwarf palm tree is self-pollinating, right? Whereas the tall tree uh, requires pollination from a, a different tree. That's a function of when they flower and when they're ready to be, to be pollinated. So as the color green dominates the color yellow in the gene here, what DJ does is if the resulting seed knot, so the, these are prospective seed knots, right? They belong, this is the mother palm, this is the Malaysian yellow dwarf. If the resulting seed knot is yellow, then it has been self-pollinated and it must be discarded. It's not a hybrid. So it's a very, very simple way to see if your uh, cross-contamination has been successful. So that's a quality control, They're very clever. I'm not very good at this. Again, now bear in mind, these are not the hybrids. This is the yellow dwarf, this is the parent, this is the mother tree. It looks very impressive, but it's not yet the hybrid. So this is, this is only 30 months old, right? Two and a half years, and you get this kind. So as, as we know, the dwarf um, flowers and fruits much earlier than the talls. So that's part of what goes into the hybridization. So in, in, in a sense, you could say the hybridization creates the dwarf trees uh, early fruiting, but with the size of fruits that come from the tall tree. That's very simplified. So here, here's what, uh, when you do hybridization, you can focus on different things. You, you uh, I mean, in the extreme case, you could decide to focus on making the tree as tall as possible, and you could do a hybrid for that, but that's not very practical. So you have to decide what it is you're optimizing for, and, and clearly GTA, it's fairly obvious what we want, right? We want something that's early fruiting, uh, that's not very tall, uh, and that's high yielding. But within that spectrum, you can optimize further, and I know Ramon has done a lot of work on that, on, on optimizing for, for instance, pest disease combined with something else. So your hybrid can be, let's say, resistant to a certain pest or more drought resistant than the others, and you still get high yield. So hybridization covers a lot of things. DJ has focused on this because we're looking at essentially a value creation tool. Right, so we want something that can create the highest possible yield the fastest possible. So it's a very commercial tree developed by DJ. So here's another little secret and probably the secret behind DJ because even in, in, in the Philippines you have perfectly good crosses of essentially the same genetic material. So you still have Malaysian yellow dwarf and, and uh, West African tall or, or another tall. Um, but what happens in, in the next level down is that you start selecting the better of the parents as well. So not only do you get the cross, so you get the hybridization, but you can now select the higher yielding mothers and the higher yielding fathers. And then you call the others and your parent stock therefore gets better and better over time. And this is where 30 years of breeding gives DJ a bit of an advantage. So it's a very labor intensive process. Emasculation means that you you uh, eliminate the male pollen from the, from the female mother tree so it doesn't accidentally self-pollinate. That's a very tedious, very long process, very labor intensive. So you have to make sure that none of this pollen actually hits the, the fruit while it's ready to be pollinated. So that comes from the tall tree. So it, it's a very professional um, commercial breeding garden. All the testing has been done. They have R&D as well, but it's really geared toward production. It's a big production line. That's pollination, so this is where the bottoms get pollinated with the male pollen. So DJ sells predominantly seed links. In other words, about six months old is, is the time when DJ have decided it's the right time to sell them. They do sell seed knots as well, but they prefer to let them grow um, I think more than anything else to make sure you identify those that are not hybrids. 
So it's a quality control aspect again. They sell them in India for, uh, I think it's about 650 rupees. So it's, it's almost it's $9 US per seedling. So it's not cheap. Okay, now let's, let's have a look at the performance. This is where it gets interesting. Um, lots of notable people obviously uh, know about DJ. DJ has had visitors from just about everywhere, including Philippines. Uh, lots of African nations are looking. Um, the first exports that DJ did was to uh, Bangladesh. So it's only recently that David Lobo has decided to go into international markets. Um, that's obviously what you really want to see. Four years old DJ hybrid. Um, at four years, it's not quite up at the 250. Uh, you can't see it here, but this tree has not been fertilized or irrigated. So once you fertilize and irrigate, you get far more. Okay, this is what I really want to talk about. So here you see the, the full power of hybridization. I think, I think we all recognize that tall palm is, is probably something like tall laguna here in, in the Philippines. Um, you see, obviously, the number of knots. I think David is probably underestimating the tender coconut water of Tall Laguna quite a bit there at, at 200 ml. But I think, I think we broadly recognize the numbers now. We know the tragedy in the Philippines. The, the average number of knots per tree is now down to 46. I think national average, is that right, Ponce? 46 knots. Uh, in Palawan, where we're active, it's more like 68. They were planted a little bit later, but the Philippines is in desperate need for rejuvenation. Okay, and that rejuvenation, um, the current production is based on a national average of 46. So you can see how many hectares would you need to replant with hybrids, with DJ hybrids, to get to the same production number. And the answer is you could actually get away with something like 20% of the current coconut land to get to the same production that we have now. But obviously the intention is to keep growing and, and put Philippines back as number one in, in these statistics. Okay, so this is coconut water. We heard about that a little while ago from PNG. Um, so coconut water, yes, attractive. Uh, we know the market is there. When we harvest coconut water, of course, we don't get developed copra because the tender coconut water from the young knot, so we're going to lose on the copra uh, supply side. And we're seeing that in the prices now of copra, that the more coconut water is bought globally, the higher the price of copra will go relative to other coconut products. So $10,000 to the farmer, the average Filipino coconut farmer earns 20,000 peso, $500. That's a bit of a gap here. See, this, this is a particular thing of mine. We've been harvesting the coconut tree wrong for 100 years at least. I'd like you to consider this. We talked about choir as an interesting product. So choir comes from the coconut husk. What's it made of? What, what's choir? Choir is cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. <clears throat> what does that mean? It means it is a, a chain, a polymer, a long chain of sugar molecules. Right? Where does the sugar molecules come from? From photosynthesis. So before it became choir and, and shell and all the rest, it was sugar, because that's what photosynthesis produces. So let's take a step back. We are doing actually integrated coconut farming in, in, in Palawan, and one of the high value coconut products that we've identified is electricity. Why is that? Well, if you take your waste stream, which is your coconut husk, one kilo of coconut husk will make me one kilowatt hour of electricity, all right? That's in the five megawatt power plant where you burn the husk to create electricity, steam turbines, very straightforward technology. That means, what's the value of one kilowatt hour wholesale? Six peso. So hold that thought. That means the husk itself is worth six peso. That's interesting. And then you get all the copper for free and all the coconut water for free. So that's quite interesting. However, the, the husk came from somewhere. It came from photosynthesis. It came from the sugar that flowed through the flower initially. 
What about one kilo of sugar? Is that worth more or less than one kilo of husk or choir, if you will? It's worth a lot more. Right? So what does that tell us? It tells us that nature is destroying value <clears throat> through the bunch. So what comes out through the photosynthesis at the stem of the flower is far more valuable than what nature produces over 12 months. This is very, very interesting. So that tells us that the right way to harvest the coconut tree might well be tapping it. Don't wait for the coconuts to develop, they're destroying them. And I'll tell you how extreme that is. We heard about Nira. One of David's customers is a wonderful farmer called Ganesh who was dirt poor 10 years ago and he has one hectare of land. One hectare. He bought 150 DJ palms and he's tapping them now. You get six liters of sap, toddy, nira, whatever you want to call it, per tree per day. He pays his tappers 20 US dollars a day. All right, that's a thousand pesos. That's what the tappers get. How can, why would he do that? Why would he pay them that much money? Because he earns a thousand US dollars per day. That's because Nira sells for 70 rupees at Farmgate, and there's a huge market for it. 70 rupees, one dollar, 50 peso. How is that for income per hectare? And that's a small farmer. I went to his house, it's a huge house. He was a poor farmer 10 years ago. So David Lobo, through this hybridization, through mass production of seedlings, he came out 30 years ago and said, I want to lift one million poor farmers, not out of poverty, but straight into middle class. He did. They're there now. So we're going to try and do the same. It requires some permits. I don't want to go too much into that. But import permit, of course, is a big issue. Um, and, and the way to get these, the DJ plant material into the Philippines is probably as embryos or immature inflorescences. And then we let our scientists, we have our Lionheart scientists down here, we have Christy, we have PCA help. Uh, we will find a way to multiply up these seedlings and then we will make them available uh, for outgrowing or for farmers. But it requires a little cooperation from the government, which we are confident we'll get, right? But let's think about this just one more time. I'm saying we are now harvesting the coconut tree in the most efficient way humanly possible. How good is that? Well, how do these numbers compare? So David has 53 tons of sugar, which we know is diabetic friendly and all that. I think we all in this room are promoting that idea and I don't disagree. 53 tons of sugar compares to 10 tons of sugar if you, if you grow it as cane, so you save a lot of land. If your objective is to make calories, let's think about that as a common denominator. This is global food security we're talking about. The common denominator for food is calories. So, okay, we can start with uh, rain-fed rice. Rain-fed rice, two tons, three tons. That's about three to four million calories per hectare. That's enough to feed four people in a year. If you put these in, you harvest 220 million calories per hectare per year, enough to feed 200. These are the efficiencies we need for global food security. But more than that, when you harvest cane, how is, how is cane grown and harvested? Cane is grown in flat land. You put a lot of nutrients, a lot of water in the soil. You put your cane cuttings. Ah, thank you. Um, then you wait for the water to evapotranspire through, the, through the, 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 the plant to create biomass. And in the center of this biomass, you have the sugar juice. In order to extract the sugar juice, you have to cut down the biomass and take it to your factory where you end up burning it. And then you start over again. That's huge, hugely inefficient. The coconut tree will stand there and deliver nira, or palm sugar, for 50 years. We don't have to cut it down to get to the nira. 
it comes out of the flower. What does that mean in, for instance, water use? Well, you need about 3,000 liters of water to make a kilo of cane sugar. The DJ hybrid needs 150. And it's the same story with uh, nutrients because you're not building this biomass up anymore, you're just harvesting photosynthesis. This is a, it's, it's, it's a food security machine. And for us in Lionheart, it is the most efficient crop bar none in terms of land use, water use, and fertilizer use. Okay. So that was a long story about this one slide, but that is, if, if you take nothing else away from these slides, that is the key point. The efficiency of the DJ hybrid, which is, you know, closely followed by Ramon's hybrids and other hybrids, but hybrids is a huge part of the solution of global food security. Well, sure, if nobody wants the coconut sugar, we can ferment it and distill it and make organic ethanol if we want. But it's not going to fetch the same market price because your car doesn't have diabetes. So there's a lot less premium that car drivers are willing to pay for organic, diabetic-friendly ethanol. So it's a product, it's in there, but it's probably not the most profitable right now. So this is just, you know, what, what should a customer of a professional breeding farm expect from his seedling supplier? It's, it's a top quality company, very, very professional. They are not happy, they don't take their money until the customer is happy. Very, very well run and managed. And that's it. So like I said, we, we are the representative, Lionheart. Um, we are working, we're at the early stages, but we will be working on, um, we're probably not gonna set up the breeding gardens because we have confidence that we can find a multiplication protocol to take in the seed material and then multiply it up within the Philippines. So that's how we propose to deliver plant material to ourselves, but certainly to the Philippines in the future. That's all. Thank you.